So EHI, we are Environmental Health Institute. We reside within National Environment Agency. Uh, in fact, within the Division of Public Health. So along with the public health uh, mandate, uh, we do the same similar thing, but with the research and the risk assessment perspective. Um, so for example, we, um, our major focus of work is on uh, environmental public health. And with, considering our relationship with all the other agencies like uh, MOH, um, hospital, you can imagine them as nodes. Uh, it's, a it's a network of uh, functional nodes. With every disease, every outbreak, every prevention, you need multiple parties to play our own role. So if you look at uh, MOH, CCD, they are uh, concerning outbreak control. And EA has a lot of operation on prevention from the environmental perspective. And EHI then support with our research and risk assessment and some surveillance as well. So what we do is uh, we work with all relevant nodes to understand the epidemiology, uh, the drivers of uh, um, infectious disease. Particularly, we focus on vector-borne diseases, foot-borne diseases, and diseases of env environmental concern, for example, Legionella. Yeah. So our main focus is our main focus is to provide scientific evidence to support operation and policies. Um, so to enable evidence-based uh, work in Singapore. Another thing that we do more is um, to look beyond the horizon, further into the horizon. So as NEA may be doing um, current operations, we look further in time and in space. In time, as in looking into the future, what are the technologies that are available that could be incorporated into our operations. Um, in space, as in looking beyond Singapore, what is happening in the region, in, especially in terms of vector-borne diseases. We know that diseases don't recognise political borders. So we need to look beyond to create the awareness and uh, to see any threats of uh, other infectious disease, particularly vector-borne diseases. So in, in EHI, what we do is we amalgamate multidiscipline. If you want to understand diseases, uh, it's a complex issue. So we amalgamate all the dis different disciplines, for example, entomology, microbiology, immunology, um, mathematical modelling, bioinformatics, genetics, everything sort of put into uh, whatever tools that are uh, useful for us. We develop the capability or we work with external parties to put all these tools together to help us understand what's going on um, particularly vector-borne diseases and food-borne diseases. At the NEA, we are at the, in the work of uh, prevention of public health risk uh, through environmental management. Um, in the prevention of risk, no program will have enough resources to do everything. So uh, risk stratification is very important. Whether it is food hygiene or is it vector-borne diseases, we need to identify areas with higher risk so that we can target the risk. So EHI does a lot of risk assessment and risk um, stratification. Um, one example that I give is I will give is uh, dengue control. Um, dengue is whole it there's transmission whole year round. However, there are periods where you will have higher transmission, and there are periods where you may get outbreak. So in e at EHI, we develop the virus surveillance system. We monitor the um, serotype of the virus. Um, this whole thing arose because um, from the observation we made previously in history where we saw that whenever there is a stereotype switch that an outbreak or a spike in cases may follow. Uh, we saw that in 2005, mm. we saw that in 2007 and in 2013 we really used it when uh, we saw the stereotype switch early in the year and we projected an outbreak and that really helped us to prepare for the outbreak in terms of uh, logistics. Um, things like, should people go on leave, you know, because it's a June holiday, right? You, typically, the dengue comes around June, July. Um, we also look at uh, logistics like um, whether there are enough um, diagnostic kits in the country. Um, information was also passed on to MOH, our relationship with MOH, as in they would then prepare for beds to ensure that there are more beds uh, to prepare for the outbreak. So this is one example of work that we do. In the um, 
So besides risk assessment, in time, we also do in space. So putting all this information in, so we have a surveillance system where you have uh, entomology, mosquito surveillance, virus surveillance, case surveillance and climate uh, parameters, weather parameters. We put all these things in and to see, to forecast what is coming. At the same time, we also do put all these things into a GIS system, the geographical information system, where then we can assess uh, regions or places with highest risk and that's where we could target more of our resources. Employing the same approach, uh, we have in the last decade actually um, detected chikungunya. We saw it coming in 2006, so we put up a surveillance system to detect the, um, in case there's any emergence. And uh, truly 2008, we saw an emergence of chikungunya. We all know that there was an outbreak of two, in 2008, 2009. And then in 2013, again, we picked up another outbreak. And that's sort of a forward defence kind of work that we have done. Um, similarly, we've done for malaria. We, we have been uh, doing a lot of uh, mosquito surveillance work out there in the field, looking for Anopheles, which is the malaria uh, vector. Um, so we are watching all these uh, population species out there, mosquito species out there, to determine whether we have risk or not. Currently, we feel the risk of malaria outbreak is low, uh, but that's something that we have to watch. Singapore is malaria-free, uh, declared by WHO, but uh, we do have the presence of the Anopheles mosquito the vector, and um, we got to make sure that the epidemiological landscape does not, suit, uh, does not shift, all right? that we have to maintain our malaria-free status. In terms of food, we do a lot of risk assessment too, and we're in, in fact looking at um, a uh, framework where we, the food inspection, food store inspection, you know, NEA licensed food stores, food, out, food outlets out there. So we're looking at a system, studying, putting all the data together to come up with a system where we can have a risk-based inspection. So places with uh, a food type with higher risk may get more inspection. Yeah. So Singapore is located in the dengue endemic region. Um, dengue fever has been um, endemic in Singapore since 1901 when the first uh, outbreak was reported. By 1960s, it, became, it overtook malaria as the most important vector-borne disease in, in, in this part um, in, in Singapore. So Singapore has got a pretty comprehensive um, dengue control program. Um, if you look at 1960s, um, we had a lot of dengue issues, especially among the children. It, just, it was a pediatric problem and, uh, and then dengue control and in those days it was DHF because there was no diagnostic kit right, to test so dengue means the hemorrhagic form or shock syndrome so there were children suffering and uh, in the 1960s, late 1960s, 1970s we had uh, en then environment ministry put in place a very comprehensive um, vector control program and then you have the Keep Singapore Clean program all gearing towards um, environmental management. Um, of course, you have the water supply, you know, the portable water supply that's in place now. You don't have to hold water anymore. All these contribute to dengue control program because basically Aedes aegypti, the very good vector of uh, dengue, breeds in pretty clean water, like household water. They like artificial containers. So um, with all these measures, we brought the house index of Singapore in Singapore down from 50% to now about 1%. House index is actually the number of mosquitoes or number of homes found breeding mosquitoes among 100 checked. So imagine in the 1960s, 1970s, if you check two homes, one would be found breeding mosquitoes. Um, but today, you need to check 100 before you could even find one. So in general, I think um, in terms of vector control, Singapore has done very well in bringing down the vector, con uh, vector population. Um, that really, the credit goes to the community. Uh, of course, NEA with, does a lot of campaigning and uh, providing evidence and knowledge, but the activity has to be done by the community. Um, so along with the drop in um, mosquito index, mosquito population, we saw dengue coming down uh, in the 1970s. 
So we had sort of maybe a decade or two of calm years, and now we see dengue coming up again since 1990s, and uh, it seems to be coming in cycle and with a peak that is increasingly larger and larger. Until 2013, we had the uh, largest outbreak. So why are we having all these outbreaks? It's all, there are lots of drivers behind, right? Firstly, of course, we have Aedes aegypti in, in, at present, which is um, very, our climate is very conducive uh, for Aedes aegypti. It's very conducive for replication of virus whole year round. Um, then on top of that, the paradox of having a good control is that our herd immunity has dropped, and which means that we have a very big population that has very low immunity to, uh, or, or, or a big population that is very susceptible to dengue, dengue infection. So we are susceptible to dengue outbreak. If you look at zero prevalence of population in a very endemic region, you could see about um, perhaps among the 12 year olds, you could have 90% of the 12 year olds having has had a dengue infection before. So a large population would be immune. In Singapore, our data shows that by the age of 16 to 20, uh, about 16% of us has had dengue before, which means as you get into the adulthood, young adulthood, um, a large population is not um, immune, which explains why we have a shift in our dengue cases, where it used to be pediatric in the past, today we see more and more uh, young adults getting it. In fact, we are seeing a pattern of increasing, um, a, a further shift that we see a lot of old people, 50, 60 year old, getting dengue as well. So this, um, on one hand, demonstrates the effectiveness of the control program, but on the, uh, on the other hand, it also tells us the risk. As we shift towards older age group, I think we need to really look into um, case management for comorbidity. Um, in our calculation, we have also shown some uh, force, of, force of infection. It used to be about 0 0.05 and today it's um, 0 0.01. Force of infection is the probability of a susceptible person to get dengue. So our probability has decreased because of the low forces, force of infection. Yeah. So um, Singapore Dengue Control Program has been evolving through the years. Um, our, our focus has always been uh, source reduction, getting rid of breathing, and when there's an outbreak where we suspect, where we suspect there's uh, infected mosquitoes, we will go in to do a, a daudicide, uh, a daudicide uh, using chemical fogging or whatever, misting indoor. Um, all these are done with the community, the, so rallying for um, community participation is something that we uh, put a lot of effort in. Um, the program has evolved through the years, and in the last 10 years, um, we have actually uh, evolved to a system where I can see three very important features. One is um, inter-epidemic surveillance and control, which means that you don't wait till the epidemic or the outbreak to happen before you work. So when we say source reduction and um, uh, authorizing and community, community participation, it's all done whole year round, even before the outbreak, so that if there's any risk of outbreak, we can moderate the outbreak, we can lower. Uh, so that's inter-epidemic surveillance. Second one is risk Based, uh, risk-based approach and control. So as I mentioned just now, no country has enough resources. So we need to work based on risk and that will increase the productivity and the uh, uh, cost effectiveness of the program. Thirdly is um, intersectoral collaboration. So NEA itself cannot do the job and MOH cannot do it. We need everybody's participation. So we have lots of stakeholders, whether it's town councils, uh, MOE, you know, the schools, uh, SLA, um, land authorities, anybody who has land. And um, so it's through this kind of uh, cooperation that we are able to um, uh, tackle dengue. And moving forward, um, as I said, it's always evolving. 
uh, we're looking into Wabakia Aedes. Um, currently, we're doing a feasibility study to see whether we can use uh, Wabakia Aedes to suppress the population further. Wabakia Aedes males, if you have male mosquito carrying Wabakia, and if they mate with a female in a wild that does not carry Wabakia, they have no progenies. Okay, if they mate, the eggs they may, the female may lay eggs, but the eggs do not hatch. So somewhat it's like a mosquito birth control. Um, so the strategy of using Wabakia aedes is perhaps uh, to have to release male Wabakia to search for the female to have a mosquito control, uh, mosquito birth control in the field. So this is something is currently only in the laboratory that we are looking at the feasibility. Um, so perhaps this could be a future tool to control, to further suppress dengue. Vector-borne diseases um, knows no border. Um, they travel, viruses travel a lot. In fact, people tell you, uh, if you want to see the world, be a virus. You get to see the world, you get carried around by people all across. So um, what we have done, we, we, we um, I think in this part of the world, very much m all the countries in this part of the world is struggling with dengue. And um, it has um, been sort of doing your own control program, each country doing their own. But really the virus is not going to stick within your country and they cross and uh, there's a lot of data that we can share with one another. For example, if I get hit badly by a tough virus, a virulent virus, um, perhaps the other countries could learn from it. Unfortunately, in this part of the world, there's um, very limited data on a virus circulating in this part of the world. So in 2012, uh, Malaysia, uh, Ministry of Health, um, and a university in uh, Indonesia, Sumatra, and ourselves, we came on together and decided to form this group called the United Dengue, which is actually, um, it stands for United in Tackling Epidemic Dengue. Um, Recognising that no single country can tackle on our own. We always, we need the support of the whole community here. So what we have done is uh, we collected samples from um, hospital, um, GP, basically it's the Singapore virus um, genotype sequence surveillance that has been expanded to the region. So um, Malaysia came on board and uh, we've been collecting data. And again, we, a similar story is seen in Malaysia where we saw in 2013 they had a big outbreak, 2014, and it was also due to a serotype switch. So that, this kind of lessons that we can actually share among us. Um, it was an interesting finding. In 2013, we got an um, outbreak in June. Then, by the end of the year, Malaysia had an outbreak too. So naturally, a lot of people will say, it's uh, our viruses, the Singapore viruses must have spread to the Malaysian virus, uh, Mal Malaysian side. But when you look at the viruses, because of this United Dengue uh, surveillance, we analysed the virus and we found that actually we were spreading different viruses. We were having an outbreak of Dengue 1, but Malaysia was having an outbreak of Dengue 2. So, um, but it's, is it why this coincident then that uh, we have outbreaks together? And that probably points to a larger picture of uh, environmental factors that is influencing both countries. There's a lot of talk about um, zoonotic diseases that viruses are hopping out from, could hop out from animal to human. Um, in terms of vector-borne diseases, some of the zoonotic ones are um, like uh, Japanese encephalitis and West Nile viruses. Now, Japanese encephalitis is uh, endemic in this region. Uh, West Nile is not. West Nile is more in Europe and in uh, America or United States. Um, so in Singapore, we don't get these diseases. So, but um, the risk is low because they're zoonotic, but it doesn't mean that it will continue to be low for forever. And because of the severity of the disease, it's something that we need to watch for. So um, at the 
at EHI. In fact, we are monitoring. These viruses are um, transmitted by another mosquito, Culex. So we have to monitor them. We have to also watch. Uh, they, they transmit viruses. Typically, JE and West Nile are transmitted from birds through the mosquito. So birds is also uh, under our surveillance. And in terms of uh, more risk, uh, when it comes to foodborne diseases, I think um, internationally, you will see more foodborne diseases as well. Um, today, a lot of people like to eat raw food. Example salad, you know, basically, you know, we, we, um, food, different food has got different risk, right? If you just want to deep fry something, of course, health-wise, not so good. But in terms of microbiological risk, probably less because they will all be killed off. So if you take raw food, it's good because you retain the nutrients, but at the same time, um, there could be risk of uh, uh, microbial, microbial risk. So, and when the environment is... Um, um, not as pristine as before, you know, as in, in globally population increases and uh, environment get more contaminated, your waterways, your coastal line get more contaminated, your seafood may get more contaminated. Um, so the, the risk of uh, foodborne diseases could be higher and this could also be linked to climate change where water, temperate, even temperate countries, water are warmer which are more conducive for microbial replication yeah, or microbial contamination. So these are things that we need to, need to watch, uh, to be watchful over. Uh, so for vector-borne diseases, uh, we are watching. In NEA, we are watching closely um, in animal host, uh, in mosquitoes. So we have a very regular surveillance. We put out traps. Um, to trap mosquitoes. So some of this very nice uh, innovation as well that EHI has is to develop trap that can, you, you know, you can just leave it there overnight and it, it does uh, hourly uh, collection of samples. Uh, so we also get to understand how the mosquito behave, when do they start biting, which, you know, where is your risk period. So these are some of the studies that we have been doing, uh, constantly watching out for um, new introduction, any, in case of new introduction of viruses. I think in Singapore, um, with our push in uh, biotechnology, life science research, um, with a lot of uh, advanced technology available to us, this is really an opportunity for us, uh, for different segment of uh, different part of Singapore, different segment, different sector, to really come together and um, um, do more research, um, be a infectious disease hub for the region.